My friend Nick Wright, co-host First Things First. Let me start with the, the Draymond Green Barkley stuff, because you've been critical of Barkley before. I think he's a great television performer, and I thought that was a great television moment where Shaq and Ernie and Kenny are playing into Charles being kooky Charles, and I also love Draymond Green. I don't think you do. What did you make of the moment? Listen, I the if I'm being totally honest, I have felt similar things feelings that Barkley felt last night, particularly watching Draymond Green execute what I believe was a figure four leg lock on (laughs) Anthony Davis. But those are typically things you keep to yourself and you don't say on national television. Now, Charles Barkley has made something of, not something of, a remarkable career on being allowed to say things on TV. None of the rest of us are. And by the way, I just want to, I have been critical of some of Charles's opinions But I've also sat with Charles and had a drink and told him that I think his LeBron James opinion is terrible. And he argued with me and we (laughs) laughed. I I think Charles is the best in the business at what he does. I have tremendous respect for him as a player and as a performer. I just think his basketball analysis is subpar, even if we might have some similarities on, in a perfect world, people that may be could be punched in the face. Yeah. Um, It was just a moment where he said it. And listen, Charles understands TV as well as anybody. This is the gift of Terry Bradshaw. This is the gift of people that are are high achievers in our business. It is television. We need to have fun. And Charles is always a lot of fun. And by the way, is a very nice guy when you meet him. As Nick told you, I I guarantee you that he bought Nick's drink. Did he not? Uh, he he ref- that is exactly right. He refused to allow me to pay. He was listen. He's great, and I I, I met him, and I said Chris had kind of made the introduction, and I had said, hey, I have to be listen. There's an opportunity face to face. I have to tell you, I've been critical about you on these things. So I told him what they were. He stops the entire bar. He's like everybody. This guy thinks LeBron James is better than Michael Jordan. <laughs> he's the be- he's the best. Uh, he's sometimes a kook, but he's the best. I love Charles. Okay, yeah, I'm watching. Steph Curry come out last night, and he is a conductor. I don't have to start. I won't take a bunch of shots. And I'm like, if Russell Westbrook could take 15% of that and play more joyfully and celebrate. Like, I look at Curry, and when I watch Curry, I see Westbrook because I see what Curry does, and I think – that's what a point guard does. Share, call Kevin Durant, recruit him, pass, efficiency. And you're not buying any of it, are you? Well, listen, that, that's great that that's what you see. When, when you see Steph Curry, that's what you see. What everyone else sees when they see Steph Curry is the greatest shooter ever to live. And that's what makes Steph, Steph. Yes, he's a good passer and he's an extraordinary ball handler. And he seems to be a man of God and a great family man and I guess a great recruiter. But what makes Steph Steph is what we saw the moment he walked on the court. He's the greatest shooter ever to walk this planet Earth, and that's what makes him special. Asking Russ to be that, you may as well ask Russ to be Joel Embiid. He's not (laughs) 7'2". He also is not the greatest shooter ever. In fact, he's a relatively poor range shooter. Like, I'm not going to ask Russ to be Steph. Yeah, I, I listen... I know, and you know how much I love you, Colin, but in, in, in Colin Coward's perfect world, there are two basketball players, LeBron James and Steph Curry, and they're duplicated <laughs> for every team at all times. Maybe a couple Ben Simmons and Kevin Durant mixed in, but we don't get that. Sometimes guys are going to have warts and flaws, and that's the reality in which at least I live in in the NBA. By the way, you did, you did text me the other day and said I may have been right in a couple of Westbrook points. You did- uh, you, listen, you may have been a little ahead of the curve on some, <laughs> some of okay. the Westbrook stuff. Okay, so I'm watching last night, and LeBron's been the asteroid that kills the baby dinosaurs. The asteroid didn't even land on the planet last night. It just flew by, and the baby dinosaurs still curled up. I mean, I watched that game last night, and I, I was actually, with about eight minutes to go, I'm like, if Toronto loses this, this will literally define the series and the franchise going forward. Am I overreacting? Listen, it's the biggest game the franchise has played since the day Vince Carter went to his graduation and then missed the shot uh, in Game 7. If you remember two years ago, the Cavs, after winning 10 straight games to start the playoffs, this is one of the first times I ever did television with you, Colin. Everyone was flipping out because the Cavs had lost two straight to Toronto. And I said to you, the minimum number of games you can take to win your conference is 12. It's going to take the Cavs 14, and that's exactly what they did. LeBron gave a very prescient quote after the Raptors won two games against them two years ago. He said, 
I've been in a lot of adverse situations. This ain't one of them. That's how he disrespected the Raptors two years ago. Last year, first quarter, game one, J.R. Smith is throwing off the backboard alley-oops in transition. That's how they disrespected him last year and this year. Whether it was the massive comeback about six weeks ago or what we saw last night, there is a mental block in Toronto when they see LeBron James on the court. Colin, they missed 11 straight shots to finish regulation. Oh. They had 16. How about this? 16 shots in the fourth quarter within five feet. They made three of them. LeBron, LeBron's terrible game, the worst game he's had all postseason, he still individually outscored them in the final four minutes of regulation. Like, they, they can't beat him. The Pacers were a tougher matchup. The Heat would have been a tougher matchup. They cannot beat him. It, 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 their players know it. Their coach knows it. Everyone in Drake knows it. It's why he's trying to fight Kendrick Perkins. They can't beat him. It's it's simple as that, man. Listen, I, I, I said this to start my show. When it comes to the Eastern Conference, there's only three things I want to talk about. One superstar player, LeBron. One superstar coach, Brad Stevens. And one prodigy, Ben Simmons. When I watch what Brad Stevens did the other night with Aaron Baines, um, mm -hmm. uh, Shane Larkin, a 20-year-old, and I believe an end table, um, and they pounded, rested Philly, it made me go, wait, time out, time out, time out. I mean, I like what Philly's doing. I was wrong, but I got to tell you something. No Kyrie Gordon, no Jalen, and thumped Philly on no rest. Nick, it made me think to myself, Philadelphia is not getting past this team for a long, long... If you can't beat Boston now, you're not beating them next year. Am I Again, am I overreacting? Okay, well, they might still get past them this year. Losing the first game on the road doesn't end the series if you're Philadelphia. But that was a coaching tour de force by Boston. I've talked to some general managers or coaches in the league that say they view Boston as a team that starts... Every game up 10 nothing because of what Brad Stevens is going to design out of timeouts and how his team is going to execute wow. at the end of quarters. It's a 10-point edge against almost every team in the league. Philadelphia is a well-coached team. Brad Stevens had his team more ready. It also makes you wonder how, how the, the only downside is you wonder how much better they get even with improved talent. How much better will Kyrie be than what Stevens is getting out of Terry Rozier. The reason I'm not ready to give the conference to Philadelphia or to Boston for the next decade is LeBron's going to have something to say about that if he stays out east, particularly if he goes to Philadelphia. Now, I know for some reason you think there's 13 players that are a better fit in Philadelphia than the LeBron James, including, I would imagine, Robert Covington, who right now he'd be taking his minutes in Philadelphia. Right. I don't feel that way. I think that if LeBron goes to Philly, they are the overwhelming favorites. But what we know is this. If ever if every team in the NBA disbanded and there was an expansion draft for a new league, the first coach taken and a guy who would be taken after only about 10 or 12 players is Brad Stevens. That's how valuable he is. That's how good he is. Yeah, I agree. Uh, his name is Nick Wright. Show is First Things First. And um, love to hear about your Charles Barkley buying you a drink story, my friend. Good talking to you. Good talking to you as well. Thank you, Colin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.